started. We talked for the last couple of weeks on the previous chapter. Does anybody remember what that chapter was entitled? Anyone? It's only been a week. Temples of Glory. It was Temples of Glory. We spoke specifically, we looked the first week, we kind of looked at a a timeline perspective from generation to generation as to what has taken place in our world around us that has affected not the church's view, but our world's view of, of morals and why has decay become so rampant, why has our society drifted so far from what it used to hold as truth. And so in the second week we look more from a scriptural standpoint uh, of where we are supposed to be, why we are supposed to be there, and again, looking at where we've come and how we've got there. And so we see that it doesn't take thousands of years for moral decay to, to, to enter into our world and from one generation to, to pass through and, and just abolish things that have once been um, you know, held as truths and dear uh, to people's heart. We also see that though something may be introduced into our world and it may be rejected at this time, the seed has been sown for that to become accepted because what it does is it introduces this terminology that we've learned a lot about, and that's tolerance. And so once something becomes interjected into our life, once something's injected into the stream uh, of our thoughts and our flow, all of a sudden the next time we see that we become somewhat tolerant of that and when we become tolerant of something we become acceptable to something and then all of a sudden it becomes just all right in our everyday life even if we haven't necessarily picked it up ourselves it becomes all right. Now this week we're going to talk about um, the uh, the other side of the coin. Holiness is an inward and an outward experience, correct? Mm -hmm. Amen. And so we're going to look now at glorify God in your spirit. And we open uh, with a, a partial uh, scripture verse from Corinthians chapter 7. It says, For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God, and that finishes up with in your spirit. And so we're going to look at glorifying God in our spirit. Why? Well, last week we looked at just a bunch of flesh, didn't we? Mm -hmm. We looked at scripture verses, yes. But they were dealing with what should we be doing, not what does the inner man say. And so if we're really going to get a handle on what we should be doing and why we should be doing it and getting a, a kind of a, a complete overview of everything, then we need to understand holiness from its fullest perspective and that is both inward and outward and so the the scripture tells us having therefore these promises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God and I know we've talked about this particular verse of scripture many times before and I'm sure it will be mentioned again many more times to come. But again, it's, it's reflecting to us that we're not just a reflection of God in our flesh. But we are to be a reflection of God also in our spirit. <coughs> and we should be glorifying God in our spirit. Yes. Now, uh, if you'll remember, there was a discussion... Uh, between Jesus and some of those that lived in that day, and they uh, they said, "But we've kept the laws. We've we've given of this, and we've given of that, and we've given of this." And and he said, "But you've left the weightier matters of the law, right. correct? Because right. just because you've given your offering in this over here, you've forgotten." love and mercy and these things right. over here. Right. We need to be careful that we don't become so hooked on what holiness should be in the flesh perspective that we forget the weightier matters of the law such as judgment, mercy, and faith. Because they are just as much a part of sanctification or cleansing or, or purity as looking at the other side of things where we've passed out rule books to everybody, 
because we want to be concerned with just the flesh. Right? Amen. And so that's why holiness is a complete package. If you are going to understand and be a person that lives holy unto God, it's not going to be because somebody has has preached you under the table with a bunch of rules and has uh, thrown these rules out to you and said you just do them and, and don't ask questions. It's going to be because you have accepted holiness on the outside as well as holiness on the inside. All right? Because holiness on the inside affects and influences our ability and our willingness to have holiness on the outside. And so... We, we must never let obedience to God's word become a, a source of arrogance in our lives. Um, Solomon admonished when he wrote in the scripture, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. So holy in our own eyes that we just walk around ignoring what real holiness is on the inside and we become that a uh, lawyer-like judge that is just picking off what is not holy and what is holy in other people. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, you know, and, and again, here again lies one of Satan's ploys. may not be his most advanced or anything else, but it's certainly very clever. Clever, if I can't destroy holiness from you, if I can't get you to just toss holiness aside in the flesh, and cause you to stop living holy in this present world, I can perhaps get you to be so confident and conceited in your holiness mm -hmm. that your holiness means nothing. Mm -hmm. right. Jesus didn't walk around and say, be ye holy and give up this, 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 and this, and this because I'm holy. Did he? Mm -hmm. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. I am holy. That's right. He didn't look to see how he was more holy than everybody else. He just said, here is the command, be ye holy, for I am holy. Amen? Amen. And so what happens is he begins to tempt us with a little bit of this thing called pride. And we've talked about pride in certain areas in relation. Satan's very familiar with pride. Pride is one of the things that caused the jealousy in him and, and the rebellion in him to come full circle and for him to be cast and banished out of the heavens. And pride furnishes fertile soil in which the seeds of envy, strife, and debate begin to flourish. And when these spirits then begin to spin out of control, all of a sudden we don't have true holiness. We may have resemblances of holiness. We may have markers of holiness in our life. Somebody may ask, well, why do you dress that way? Or why do you do your hair that way? And your natural response may be because the Bible tells me that I'm supposed to be holy. But there'll be no real mark of holiness in our life because of the fact that we have become judgmental and critical. Mm -hmm. And pride has become that thing that flourishes in our life to destroy us and causes us one of the most dangerous things in our lives and that's comparing ourselves by ourselves yeah that's right and i don't care what it is in a in a christian's life that has brought them to this place be it holiness salvation uh gifts of the spirit uh tithing i, I don't care what it is that falls under this banner but any time that we're comparing ourselves against ourselves we're wrong amen if you want to say, I must be more right with God because I gave $100 more than the Colberts did this year, that doesn't make me more right than the Colberts are right. Because he looked at the widow who walked to the box and he said, she hath given all that she had. Right. Isn't that right? Yep. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of reading this particular week because... Uh, as Sister Reader began to pin, uh, she used a, an example which I, I would be hard-pressed to try to either summarize and or to come up with a competitive uh, example of my own. And So let me just, if I could, her husband's name was Michael, and as a new convert, her husband experienced firsthand the destructive effects of spiritual fault-finding. 
And I'm sure that if you've been around any length of time, you've probably run into one or two, maybe more individuals that had that certain gift of the Spirit on their own. Amen? Amen. They were spiritual fault finders. That was the gift that they felt God had given them. And that was to enlighten the world as to where people were at fault in the Spirit. Let me read you his story because as, as it reveals in his life, and thank God, you know, at that sake, a, a point of time, he was able to become aware of what was going on and, and cause the ship from completely spinning out of control. But let me read you the story so you begin to catch a glimpse of how dangerous and how quickly something like this can settle into our walk with God. Mm -hmm. I'm not just talking about somebody else's walk with God. I'm saying it can settle into our walk That's with right. God. That's right. And if we're not careful to notice the soil that is being fertilized within our lives and our hearts, then we can sometimes begin to grow seeds that we've not intended to grow. And once you begin to grow those seeds and they begin to flourish, we better watch out. Nobody plants weeds. They nope. just seem to grow. That's right. Amen? Mm -hmm. And if we're not careful, they will grow to the point, as the Scripture does tell us, that they will then choke out all that that grows, oh, we've intended Jesus. to grow. So here is his story. I remember when I first came into church in 1979, it was the greatest thing that had ever happened in my life. <coughs> Excuse me. I came out of the world in the days of John Travolta and Saturday Night Fever when disco was the rage. And I know that nobody can relate. <laughs> I know that this is probably before the majority, if not everybody, within this physical congregation tonight was born. But hey, I was there. All right. My usual dress was a tattered t-shirt and blue jeans. However, I became caught up in the disco craze. So I purchased white, high-waisted, bell-bottom pants, a white vest, and a black shirt with a big collar. Again, just for the sake of your visual appearances today, when I say I, remember that I'm referring to this man named Michael. Okay? Please don't put me as John Travolta in your eyes. It'd be tough to listen to me preach on further occasions. But in the life that he is displaying for us as the... He, he's talking about his life as he was getting ready to come to Christ. It said, I also bought an awesome crushed red velvet outfit that had high-waisted bell-bottom pants, a vest, and a white collared pink shirt. Together with my black platform shoes, these were by far the best clothes that I owned. I've said, I suppose. Yeah. I was ready to hit the disco floor, but God decided it was time for me to hit the altar. He called me, he chose me, he saved me, praise God. Just four months after I obeyed the Acts 2.38 experience, camp meeting time came. I'm sure that in each and every one of our lives, we can remember how it was after we came to the truth or the knowledge of a little bit of truth and all of a sudden a conference or a retreat or a camp meeting came and all of a sudden we felt like we had been immersed in the greatest waters of, of the world and the rejuvenating fountains began to flow as preachers that we didn't know and didn't know us really began to preach to our hearts and our minds. And I'm sure that you can relate. And that's, that's, that's what he's experiencing. It says, I was ecstatic. I, I couldn't wait to go. I got rid of my, I, excuse me, I got rid of my green Gideon Bible and purchased a new one bound in black leather. The only criterion choosing my Bible that, was that it looked good at my side. As I packed for camp, it was obvious that my best clothes must be included. So into my suitcase they went. They were all beside the blue jeans and tattered t-shirts that I own. Camp meeting was just like they said it would be. The choir sang like angels. The preacher was on fire. I arrived early for every service so I could sit on the front row. <coughs> Excuse me. As a new convert, I was drinking it all in and basking in the glory of my new Holy Ghost filled life. And then it happened. While in one of the services, I stood there in my freshly clean, crushed red velvet outfit, admiring all of God's wonderful people. 
a view made easier by the fact that my shoes made me three inches taller. <laughs> Suddenly, two elderly women descended upon me, clothed in, bat in black from their chins to their wrists and to their ankles and the pictures of holiness from head to toe. These ladies came. They stopped in front of me and began staring and glaring, looking me up one side and down the other. Then with a tisk tisk, they shuffled off with stern faces and critical eyes. Standing there in dazed shock, I wondered what I had done to deserve such castigating scowls. Up to that point, I had the newborn belief that Pentecostal saints could do no wrong, yet it was obvious that I did not meet with their approval. Two people who had no idea that I was only four months old in the Lord shattered me. All they knew was what I was wearing was too inappropriate for them. Why is it that the holier some people get, the more critical they become? Perhaps they have missed the point of what true holiness really is. Those two women could have destroyed my newfound faith with their judgmental attitudes. Like many others, I could have succumbed to the devil's lie that there is no love in the church. And maybe there is no love in some churches. But here's the danger in that statement. And I want everybody to understand the depth of that statement. Maybe there is no love in some churches. But here is the problem. There is no love in the world. Mm -hmm. And so if there is no love in the church, then the only equality that I can bring to that is that the church has in itself become worldly. Right. Mm -hmm. And my Bible still says, love not the world, neither the, neither things, the things that are in, in the world. world. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. The church ought to be a haven of love. Yep. It ought to be a sanctity, a refuge. Mm -hmm. Granted, there ought to be changes in our lives that are sparked by the presence of God and the teaching of his word. But that should never come from saint to saint. We talked just several chapters ago. It all starts at the top, didn't we? Yep. And we watched the natural progression as things flow down on us, correct? Mm -hmm. And so we have got to become very careful that we don't become so pious in our own attitudes that we think that we have arrived, mm -hmm. that we are the last hope of the holiness movement right. and that we've got to go around telling everybody that thinks they're holy exactly what they still need to work on. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a home missions church myself. This is the I part of this, not the Michael part of this, but I grew up in a home missions church and as the church began to observe a little bit of Holy Ghost explosion and revival was setting in and and people were being born again of the water and spirit. I watched as certain individuals who really didn't know how to spell holiness walked around telling people exactly why they still weren't holy before the Lord. And church, it's something that we've got to understand is that if we don't have love in our church, then the norm becomes backbiting, backstabbing, envy, hatred, unforgiving, jealousy, mercy, Listness, pride, and I'm pretty sure, but if we were to look in our New Testament, I think we would find that these are the conditions that do not make heaven their right. own. Mm -hmm. And I thought we were in this because we wanted to make heaven Amen. our own. That's right. Amen. 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 And I thought the reason that you had succumbed to the sound of my voice and said, I'm going to church on a Tuesday night because I'm going to listen to things that are going to help prepare me to make heaven my home. Mm -hmm. Jesus told a parable to certain people who trusted in their own righteousness and they despised others. The parable went like this. I'm sure you will recognize it as we get into it, but the parable has a faithful truth at the end. It says, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed with, thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, 
or even as this publican, in other words, as one of the other members that have come into the house of God to pray. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not even as much as lift up his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The parable tells us that the publican was the one that went down. The sinner was the one that went down justified. While the self-righteous Pharisee, we won't call him righteous, we won't call him holy. The self-righteous Pharisee brought shame upon himself, brought indignation upon himself brought fault-finding and critical attitudes, brought a spirit that wanted to measure himself against those that stood around him. The Lord justified the man with many faults rather than the man who thought he had but few faults. If our fasting and tithing make us proud, then our fasting and tithing has brought us to naught. Yep. We've talked several times uh, during our regular services, particularly on Sunday, uh, a few weeks ago. In fact, we talked on a Sunday morning and, and we used the big M word. And, and, and the entirety of our lesson literally flowed around the M word. And that M word, folks, is motive. We looked at David and why did David number the children of Israel? He knew it was a sin. He knew it was wrong before God. His sergeants and his captains stood in his presence and they asked him the question. They said, are you sure you want to do this thing? You know that it really doesn't matter how many people are out there that are fighting for us because if we need more, God will just somehow give them to us. They tried to persuade him knowing that it was wrong and he knowing it was wrong did it anyway. What is our motive if I'm fasting so that I can say I fast more than somebody else, my motive is wrong and I've not drawn any bit closer to God and I've not brought my flesh under subjection, right. which is supposed to be the motive of fasting. If my motive in tithing is to compare myself to somebody else, then my motive is wrong because my motive is supposed to be obedience and joyful giving unto the Lord. It's awful quiet. Amen. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. Our motives must be right. If our holiness makes us haughty and we start to despise other people, then we really need to check the dipstick of our soul because that's not holiness. Because holiness does not exist in the absence of love. The Bible tells us God is love. That's right. That's right. Isn't that right? Amen. And you can only have holiness in the presence of love. Because you'll never have righteousness in the absence of love. Right. These things flow from each other. James taught us this, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if you judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. And he said, let us be not hearers only, but doers. What was the scripture? He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. Smite me, Lord. Smite me. The judgment seat may be the best seat in the house, but there's only one who is qualified to occupy that seat of power and judgment. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and labeled them as what? Anybody remember? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. He called them openly and outwardly. He called them 
hypocrites. Mm -hmm. The reason he called them hypocrites was because they focused on their outward appearance while ignoring the inward condition of their heart. They talked about how magically they dressed, how many times they prayed, how much they had given. They talked about how they had done this and how they had done that, but they had completely ignored the inward condition of what God said was important. Mm -hmm. he, called, he said this, he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup mm -hmm. and of the platter, but within you are full of extortion mm -hmm. and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside may be clean also. Indicating to us, though we've measured up completely on the outside, and we've dotted the I's and we've crossed the T's, that the outside actually is still dirty because the intention and motive was wrong because it didn't flow from the inside dictating with and so all these places and all these times that you've heard well we just need us a set of rules and if i wish pastor would just give us a set of rules so we knew where we needed to stand and how we needed to stand and where we needed to go and how we needed to go it's not like that at all because if you have followed those rules and you don't have holiness on the inside then you're still dirty on the outside That's right you just look good doing it That's right Lucifer was the first one who was perfect in outward beauty. Yet he was filled on the inside with deception and murder. Jesus warned us that our appearances could be deceiving. He said, woe unto you. Isn't it interesting how many verses of Scripture we're pulling up at tonight? Woe unto you. Yeah. He said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you like white sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. In other words, you can look holy from head to toe and be nothing more than a hypocrite pulling on a shallow display of insincere piety. That is right. You ever been to the furniture store looking for a new dresser? And as you're walking down the long rows of dressers, you just, oh, I like that. It will really look sharp. And it's in our price range. How does that happen? And then you buy it and you bang it when you're walking through the door of the house or trying to get it up the stairs. And all of a sudden it cracks. You're like, wood shouldn't crack like that. See, the problem is it wasn't wood. It was this cheap, cheap thing on the inside covered with this slim portion of veneer mm -hmm. on the outside. To see veneer just has a capability of covering the outside to make it look like something else. That it isn't. And that's what he's indicating to us here. Is that we can do all the stuff right on the outside. Mm -hmm. And if we've never addressed the spirit. Then what we've done is we've pulled a mask over who we really are. For all the world to see. Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 through 15 Paul emphasizes proper attitudes of the inner man. He says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now, are any of those things that you're putting on the outside? No, they're not. Mm -mm. They're the conditions of the inner man. That's right. He said, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against you, uh, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. It doesn't say which is like the bond of perfectness. It says which is the bond of perfectness. 
And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and that you would be thankful. Again, inner man. That's why the Bible says, strive to follow peace with all men and holiness. That verse of scripture has nothing to do with your outer man. That's mm, right. That verse of scripture has everything to do with your inner man. Mm -hmm. Strive to follow peace with all men oh, and Lord. holiness mm -hmm. without which no man shall, shall see, the, see the Lord. When he says, be ye holy, for I am holy, he's talking about inward and outward. Mm -hmm. But that portion of scripture in Hebrews where he says, follow peace with all men and holiness... That is concerning our inward, who we are on the inside. What is dictating what's going on in and out of our lives? Because we can become so full of ourselves so quickly. The trumpet of truth must always sound a clear note. However, the truth must be coupled with mercy. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil, the scripture tells us. The psalmist also penned this, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. We have to be careful of that which is flowing out of our inner man. I don't care how long you've served the Lord. How short a time you've served the Lord. You've got to understand. I've preached and preached. Holiness is just as much an inner man thing. Yes, it is. As it is an outer man thing. Mm -hmm. It's the express reason why I teach principles. Because principles can be applied and understood everywhere. At all times. Three times in the word of God. The church is enjoined to worship the Lord. In the beauty of holiness. Many times this injunction. Is perceived as worshiping the Lord. In holiness standards. Such as our hair. Our clothes. The places we go. The things we ingest. However to worship the Lord. In the beauty of holiness literally means to worship the Lord in the beauty of being like Him. It's not just an outside thing. The very nature of God is holiness. Moses spoke in worship when he said, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Isaiah penned it like this in verse chapter 6, verse 3, when he cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. God is the very essence of pure, unadulterated, holy beauty, which is why he could stand and command us to be ye holy, for I am holy. It wasn't a judgmental, critical point. Uh, position from him it was a drawing mm -hmm. it was a clarion call to those that claim to be children of the name to not just stand in a position of having your sins washed away oh yeah I'm sure Michael understood after a little bit of time that dressing like John Travolta was just not going to cut it in the church but that's not how God intended for us to come. I mean, you wouldn't want to see your pastor in red, red velvet, high-waisted bell bottoms. No. 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 Thank you, somebody, for saying no. I do appreciate it. it. Let's me know that either someone's awake or the rest of you just not sure what holiness has to do with it. <laughs> I'm sure he would have gotten to that point where he understood that God was calling us to look different. Mm -hmm. The 
but we shouldn't be the ones running around taking care of God's business. Right. Amen. Judging the world. Uh -huh. Amen. 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 And it's odd, you know, I've, I've seen through the years, and it's just a personal observation, that sometimes the people who become so critical have faults in the same areas that they become critical of. Mm -hmm. Yep. Holiness standards are a medium whereby we separate ourselves from the world and all of its influences of evil. As we are cleansed inside and out from the bondage of sin, the vestiges of Satan's control become eradicated from our lives. That's why the Bible says you are a new creature. Mm -hmm. He didn't just say you put on new skin, <laughs> gave you a change of clothes. Instead, he said you're a new creature. All things are passed away. All Behold, things, all things are have become, become new. We are no longer under Satan's devices. This enables the image of God to shine forth and reflect in the earth as we become holy. Mm -hmm. Not as we are made holy, or we are divinely fashioned in holiness, mm -hmm. but as we become holy, even as he is holy. Our holiness standards by themselves will never save us. Right. The absence of them will certainly damn us right. to a hell. Right. But just having the outward standards of holiness won't save us. Because holiness was more about obedience and submission to the Word of God than it ever was about just changing the clothes you wear and the way you do your hair. It's obedience and submission. Obedience. Do you realize that he says repent or perish? Repent or perish? Mm -hmm. I just decided to repent on my own. Regardless of why you decided to repent, right. it was obedience and submission to God's word. Right. Well, I, somebody just said, you know, you need to be baptized. I didn't know why I was doing it. Hey, somewhere, subconsciously, even if at that level you knew God commanded me to do this. Mm -hmm. I need to be obedient and submissive if I want to be saved. Mm -hmm. Why would anything else be different in the salvation process? Amen? Amen. Amen? It's obedience and submission to the Word of God that brings salvation. The inward work of the Spirit is reflected in the outward application. We've talked about it several times. I, I don't know how many other ways to say it. The outward will always begin to reflect at some point in time the, the conditions of the inside. That's right. You might be able to mask it for a little while, but it eventually works its way out. God is glorified in us as the beauty of Jesus is manifested in our body and our spirit. Not just our body, but our body and our spirit. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand.